Allergy and Asthma Network is committed to reaching every asthma patient with guidelines-based information and support. In the past year, in light of COVID, spotlighting the disparities in healthcare, we have been resolute We appear to be having a small technical difficulty. Uh, we, we're having just a little internet issue today. So, um, uh, Tanya, are you able at this point to, to hear me and join us, or are you um, having internet issues? Okay. Well, this is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. It, we are very pleased you're here with us today. Uh, we wanted to just remind you that the mission of Allergy and Asthma Network has been the same since we began our work in 1985 to end needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through a four-prong approach of outreach, education, advocacy, and research. We have a very special speaker with us today. Dr. Monica Webb Hooper is Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She works closely with the director and leadership to oversee all aspects of the Institute and to advance the mission of promoting the health of populations with health disparities and health equity. Dr. Webb Hooper is an internationally recognized trans transitional behavioral scientist and licensed clinical health psychologist. She has dedicated her career to the scientific study of minority health and racial ethnic disparities, focusing on chronic illness prevention and health behavior change. Her program of community engaged research focuses on understanding multi level factors and biopsychosocial mechanisms underlying modifiable risk factors. She's actively involved in the scientific responses to COVID 19, leading large scale initiatives with the voices of the underserved communities in mind. Before joining NIMHD, Dr. Webb Hooper was Professor of Oncology, Family Medicine and Community Health, and Psychological Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. She was also Associate Director for Cancer Disparities Research and Director of the Office of Cancer Disparities Research in the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. During her time as a professor, Dr. Webb Hooper directed the Tobacco, Obesity, and Oncology Laboratory. Dr. Webb Hooper completed her doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of South Florida, internship in medical psychology from the University of Florida Health Sciences Center, and her Bachelor of Science from the University of Miami. And we also welcome back the medical expert for our webinar series, Dr. Pervy Parikh. Dr. Parikh is an adult and pediatric allergist and immunologist at Allergy and Asthma Associates of Murray Hill. She is currently on faculty as clinical assistant professor in both departments of medicine and pediatrics at New York University School of Medicine. She's been passionate about health policy and is on the board of directors of the Advocacy Council of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Dr. Parikh is a spokesperson for Allergy and Asthma Network. She frequently makes appearances as a medical contributor on our behalf to NBC, Fox, CNN, Wall Street Journal, and CBS. She has her own monthly column in the US News and World Report. Thank you so much for joining us, Drs. Parikh and, uh, and Dr. Webb Hooper. I need just a moment to uh, make sure that I've got the slides for today. Uh, Tanya, are you able to advance the slides or are you not able to hear me at all? Okay, well, I'm going to just take one. I, I, I can advance, Sally. Can can everyone see and hear my screen now? You again. So yeah. if, yeah, I just did the introduction. So if you want to start right with Dr. Webb Hooper's section or your section for the um, the outline of the day. It's fine. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, again, I apologize. I am in a remote location and may have some technical difficulties, hence the reason why we'll be shifting um, should need be. But the program outlined today is, first of all, hearing directly from Dr. Webb Hooper on the science in reducing the COVID-19 impact among African Americans. And then I will follow up with the current state of COVID and what's in the news as we have now approached the one-year mark of the pandemic. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Parikh on vaccine update and issues. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Webb Hooper. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and I'm delighted to be here and participating in this really important conversation. We have all been dealing with the pandemic for a year, so I hope everyone is holding up as, as well as you can and coping. And uh, today what I'd like to talk about is some of the work being conducted at NIH and also some of my own research around um, addressing important factors that are associated with COVID-19 and also with addressing uh, community engagement and trust within the community, which have emerged as really important topics as we've experienced the pandemic. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to mention that the views expressed during this presentation do not necessarily reflect those of NIH or of the U.S. government. Next slide, please. So I think many of us are aware of the startling statistics about COVID-19 cases and mortality, and I believe that you'll also be hearing more updated statistics today. And this slide is about patients who are at the highest risk of severe outcomes due to their pre-existing medical status. Studies thus far point to more deteriorating outcomes among patients with medical comorbidities compared to patients without them. COVID-19 patients with a history of a number of chronic illnesses, uh, including chronic lung disease, cancer, obesity, and others have a worsened prognosis and most often end up with complicating outcomes such as pneumonia. These patients are not only at risk for contracting the virus, but there is significantly increased risk of death. We also know that among adults, those ages 65 and older, account for about 80% of COVID-19 mortality. Next slide, please. So given the availability of the increasing availability of vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, there's been lots of discussion about ensuring um, that, that these vaccine, vaccines are accepted widely so that we have an opportunity to reach herd immunity. And one of the constructs that has come up quite a bit is that about vaccine hesitancy, which is a complex psychological construct. It's a cognitive and behavioral construct that varies for specific vaccines. It differs by place and by time. It's very dynamic and it represents the midpoint of this continuum ranging from complete refusal to accept it or full acceptance with no hesitation. And this is influenced by what we call the three C's, complacency, convenience, and confidence. And the biggest concern is that without intervention among those who are not who are the most hesitant, that hesitancy may shift to complete refusal. And for scientists at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, efforts to recognize, understand, and address the population-specific reasons for COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy are important. Commonly reported reasons for low vaccine confidence relate to concerns about the speed of development of the vaccines, potential harm from ingredients, yet unknown longer-term health effects, and unanswered questions about whether the vaccine prevents infection and transmission. Next slide, please. So survey findings, there have been multiple cross-sectional surveys conducted across 2020 and into 2021 that have um, asked respondents about their attitudes and beliefs about COVID-19 vaccines. So survey findings from December in the United States revealed racial ethnic differences among those who indicated that they would definitely or probably accept a COVID-19 vaccine. So this was before the vaccines were really available, just maybe starting around the time of the Pfizer's emergency use authorization. So at that time, about 42% of African-American respondents reported probable acceptance, followed by 61% of white individuals, 63% of Hispanic Latino individuals, and 83% of Asian respondents. Now, these data actually reflected an improvement. If you looked at numbers from September, where the percentages were even lower, but I would say these numbers are lower than what we need to see and show that have work to do. Um, and even among individuals who are regularly vaccinated against the flu, um, in this report, African Americans were more than twice as likely to say that they wouldn't seek the COVID-19 vaccine. I think the good news is that this is continuing to change. 
and it represents the dynamics of when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, that it changes over time and that many people who are in what we call that movable middle, the wait and see category, that they're having an opportunity to wait and see as they wait to become eligible for vaccination. And so we are seeing that these numbers are improving. And I actually recently read a poll, maybe it was just a few days ago, showing that the, the racial difference between African-American respondents and white respondents had, had been eliminated in terms of vaccine um, hesitancy. So this is positive news, but we do have to continue to monitor it because national surveys are um, at a point in time and they may not pick up some of the most vulnerable populations across racial ethnic lines who may be expressing still hesitancy about um, accepting vaccination. Next slide, please. These data are from an initial analysis of the of 17 states at that time in two cities in late January that released vaccination levels by racial ethnic population. Some of you may have seen this report or there's been an updated one, but the pattern in the updated report from early March is the same. And I find it striking. Here you see dispersion, which is showing that as of late January, and it remains true in March, the rates of vaccination among African-American adults in these locations are lower than they should be. So as an example, if you look at North Carolina, which I believe is the third location down, African-Americans account for 22% of the population and 26% of the healthcare workforce, but only 11% of vaccine recipients. And this is not all due to vaccine hesitancy. We know from various reports that there are issues around equitable access and competition to receive import, uh, appointment, appointments for the vaccine that, that are contributing to these data, something that we need to be concerned with. Let's look at the contrast. Next slide, please. So this is um, the same data, but looking at um, white adults who are getting vaccinated. And you can see that the, that the lines are tighter together, the colors are tighter together. And that means that white adults are getting vaccinated at closer to or higher than expected levels in most of the states that are examined here. Now, an important point, again, that this is not all due in terms of African Americans to vaccine hesitancy. We have structural factors, access, digital divide, the competition. There are probably other reasons driving this as well as misinformation, which we know is everywhere. And the problem with misinformation is it's potentially elevated adverse impact among communities most affected. We are still early in the process of vaccine distribution. So again, we need to monitor vaccine hesitancy and equitable access and combat misinformation. Next slide, please. So I want to tell you a little about the NIH Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities, or the SEAL initiative, which is working on this from a national perspective. That is debunking misinformation and disseminating accurate messages, particularly in disproportionately affected populations. The website is here. It's an evolving website with lots of great fact-based, evidence-based resources. So I encourage you to review that, it's got information for the lay um, population as well as for healthcare providers. Next slide, please. The, um, the overarching goal of SEAL is to understand factors that contribute to the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 in underserved communities. We are working with community partners across sectors to address misinformation, engage trusted voices, facilitate enrollment in COVID-19 clinical trials. And this is an investment within communities across this multi-sector alliance, all comprised of individuals who are committed to this goal of addressing health disparities. Next slide, please. The SEAL Alliance currently includes 11 states highlighted in blue. And these states were funded in the summer. And these were areas of the country at that time with surging cases and a disproportionate COVID-19 burden among racial ethnic minoritized populations. And soon the SEAL Alliance will be expanding to bring on other states. Next slide, please. So the SEAL Alliance is about the ground game. And here are just a few of many examples of the activities happening in partnership with local communities. So these teams are conducting a variety of activities, such as fostering clinical trial inclusion, conducting community needs assessments, and building awareness about how to stay healthy while providing personal protective equipment, 
hand sanitizer, and other needed resources within the community. So it's, it's a bi-directional engagement of co-learning and sharing information. Next slide, please. So the reach of SEAL in just a few months uh, when we actually launched activities has been very strong. We are conducting a range of activities, including text messaging campaigns, distributing um, resources, materials, hosting webinars and town halls, and having local community meetings. And SEAL has reached over 3 million people with accurate educational messages, which I'm, which I'm sure is an underestimate of the reach of SEAL thus far. And I don't know that my slide that I fully updated, but it's, it's, it, there are lots of people day to day being impacted by SEAL. Next slide, please. So the issues around trust and distrust in underserved communities is real and it precedes COVID. It, it may just be heightened to some degree now. And since 2017, I've had the honor of working with a dedicated and amazing community advisory board who is known for a long time and emphasized that we need to focus on understanding and addressing community trust and distrust for healthcare in the local underserved communities. So we formulated a study and we published the first set of results in 2019, and we didn't know how much more relevant this work would be today. So this was a listening tour conducted among 130 adults at nine community-based sites in Northeast Ohio. Next slide, please. And um, there were many themes that emerged during the study. And this sample was comprised of about 80% of African-American adults and about 20% of white adults. And what we found was an overarching theme um, where African-American participants exhibited greater distrust compared to white. And they really described perceptions of healthcare being about big business versus concern about patients' well-being. Uh, they reported greater financial hardships. They discussed um, disparities in the quality of care that they received, poor patient-clinician communication, and skepticism about biomedical research as an example. And this was an infographic that we made sure to return our findings to the community so that they would understand what we learned. And we also shared this information from the study with not only through the publication, but with the healthcare system providers and leadership with the goal of instituting change. Next slide, please. And while I don't have time to get into the full details, I welcome you to review the article and I can share that the reasons for distrust were more than individual beliefs and attitudes. They involve direct, interpersonal, medical provider and healthcare systems, problems and injustices. And this quote was one that really stayed with me. Our participants stated when asked about what healthcare systems, doctors, and researchers could do to gain trust, participant indicated, we don't care how much you know until we know how much you care. And that resonated with me very much. Next slide, please. So once our group listened, we wanted to do more to help. And our findings signaled that an active community responsive approach focusing on these topics that were brought up by our participants in a thematic way, might be an avenue to provide lay-oriented um, information, address misinformation, and begin to remediate distrust, which we realize is a process. So this is different than sending out educational messages alone in a very passive way. Next slide, please. So, and actually, when you look at the scientific literature, there are a few concrete real-world examples of community-driven approaches to address the distrust of healthcare and research. So for our second project, we brought what we refer to as a user-generated intervention out into the community. We saw that there were many questions that needed answers and clarifications about how physicians operate, what support services are available within hospitals, among many other concerns. So we decided to bring with us this time people who actually have the answers to these questions. Next slide, please. So nine um, clinicians and clinical researchers and seven support services professionals volunteered their time to engage with our community members. Next slide, please. So we went back into the same community that we visited the first time, which is important to demonstrate that we would be back and this was not a one-off. Are we able to advance? Oh, we've gone too far. Got to go back two or three. 
So we told our participants, um, I wonder if something is missing. Yeah, we must have something missing. Um, but we told our participants that this would be a rare opportunity for them to talk directly with health educators and social workers and researchers where they could ask their own questions. So generating their own intervention, a user-generated approach, and it was their opportunity to ask questions, things that they wanted to know about health, how health systems, doctors, and researchers operate. And you can't see the data, so I, it's hard for me to kind of explain it without you seeing it, but they asked a lot of questions when we brought them in this situation. And, and you know, questions about such as, why does it seem that my doctor does not listen to me? Why do doctors spend so little time with patients? Why has the healthcare system changed so much? Um, why do doctors prescribe so many pills that don't seem necessary? Uh, and then on the research end, questions about, you know, how can we be sure that researchers are not just using us as guinea pigs? And these participants also had a chance to talk with support services healthcare professionals, like social workers and health educators. And they asked a lot of great questions about how Medicare works, um, why their medical bill arrives months after the visit. Um, and so it was a really rich conversation and they were able to ask questions that they never usually had the chance to answer. And what we learned from our evaluation and some of the findings was that the participants found this experience to be beneficial as it relates to addressing trust and distrust. So about 90% of participants, so almost everyone reported that they agreed that they did have the opportunity to ask questions that they wanted. They perceived the professionals to be very trustworthy, about 80% strongly agreed with that, which was excellent. We also found that the clinicians and clinical researchers who came out and met with our community members really attended to their concerns. They addressed myths, they used lay language, and they showed empathy. Now, we did find that our questions about trust in healthcare systems, researchers, and whether or not someone would participate in the clinical trial as a result of this, of, of this experience, the ratings were strong there as well, but not as strong as sort of that interpersonal trust level. And I think that that makes sense because addressing institutional and biomedical research trust and distrust are complex constructs that are not easily modified in one dialogue. But I think the study showed that there are promising approaches to working through the distrust by taking the time to demonstrate trustworthiness with underserved members of a community. And so, so that would be an important next step for this work is to look at multi-level approaches that incorporate upstream determinants, such as health system factors, to improve trustworthiness um, and to achieve diversity in clinical trials and really turn this dial toward health equity. And uh, finally, the slide you're looking at here is I just wanted to invite you to check out an interview that I conducted with my parents-in-law in, in late 2020, and it was released about a week ago. They, they are participants in a COVID-19 vaccine trial, and I shared this interview because they really show the diversity within a community. So among African-Americans, they are, are you know, willing participants, enthusiastic participants in trials. And I think it shows that the myth that is often perpetuated that racial ethnic minorities do not want to participate in research and are not interested in this is not true. Um, and we actually have other vigorous trials and studies that show this. But they were, it was really helpful for people who might be vaccine hesitant and who have concerns to hear about the experience of senior retired African-American individuals who are enthusiastic about this process and about doing what they can to help eliminate uh, or reduce the, you know, the effects of the pandemic. So I will stop there. I thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Dr. Webb Hooper, and I apologize for that missing slide, but that was a wonderful presentation and certainly helped us to better understand the attitudes and concerns around health, health equity and vaccination hesitancy. Uh, so the first question that's come in, as I said, we are gonna take Dr. Webb Hooper questions at this point for just a couple of minutes before she has to depart. The first question is, we understand that the emphasis of the data you shared was specifically about the African-American community, but could you speak to any of the Office of Minority health and the response to the Native American community. We have someone on the line who has expressed an interest in knowing what we're doing to, are we seeing these same types of trends in the Native American community and are there specific um, efforts to engage that community? 
Great question. So the SEAL initiative that I discussed is, is actually focused on communities who are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So it's not limited to African Americans at all. African Americans are one of the priority populations as well as American Indian Alaska Native populations, as well as Hispanic Latinos, uh, Pacific Islanders, and um, uh, Native Hawaiians are the main um, groups that we're thinking about. And because of the, the, the undue burden of the pandemic. And so we are also developing engagement strategies that are culturally specific and community competent to address the needs of these uh, various populations. And uh, what our data suggests thus far is actually very positive as it relates to American Indian populations, particularly those who are on reservation and tribal lands, that um, vaccine uptake is actually quite good. Um, and I think that the hesitancy, that, that people are enthusiastic in general, with, with some differences across, but certainly this effort is about engaging all the communities that are disproportionately affected and coming up with the strategies and bringing the trusted voices for communities to get their questions answered. And what we found um, in most of the communities and particularly American Indians as well, is that Dr. Fauci is um, one of the most trusted voices in the country. Yes. And so he is you know, always primed and, and does everything he can to, um, to address the needs of all of these communities. So that's been great. Yeah, it's been wonderful to see how well Dr. Fauci has been received um, across barriers and, and across communities. And so again, likewise, Dr. Webb Hooper, you have been a voice of consistency and reason and leadership in this very uncertain time. And we just appreciate you spending the time with us today. And we'll look forward to uh, continuing to work together through our Not One More Life Trusted Messengers program, the SIL program, and many of the other efforts that are coming out of the National Institutes of minority health and health inequity. So thank you so much for being here today and we're going to move on with the program at this time. Thank you. I would also remember uh, remind everyone that there is a, an updated certificate of attendance. I know there was an issue with the one that was originally loaded, but the updated certificate of ten attendance is available now. So go to the control panel and the handouts pane and you can receive that certificate of attendance uh, today. You can also email us after the course of today's webinar should you have issues with obtaining that. So now we're going to take a look at what is the current state of COVID as we sit here on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2021, exactly one year from the date that we began this journey of our COVID-19 webinars in response to the Allergy and Asthma Network community. We always, again, like to go to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus COVID-19 dashboard. Um, we can see here that we have now topped over 120 million global cases of COVID, with the U.S. representing almost one-fourth of those, so right at 30 million as of today. And then when we look at the global death toll rate, we are at 2.673 million global deaths, with over 536,000 of those being attributed to the U.S. So again, total uh, cases, we're looking at about 25% total death rate. Uh, again, the U.S. is co um, comprising uh, about uh, a 20%, 25% um, uh, makeup there as well. Uh, again, we, we trust this data. We know that it is the most reliable data that is uh, looking at COVID-19 on the global scale and also really also has the ability to dive in at the in-country level much more detailed. We also rely heavily on CDC. And so again, we always share this trend of the seven-day case rates per 100,000. It is on the decline uh, at 114.4. And again, you can see that we had just under 50,000 new cases on the last report from CDC. Uh, there are still a few states where it's a very dark navy blue. Um, or the darker the blue, again, the higher the case rates per 100,000. So in the Northeast, we're still seeing some states that have that high end of the case rate, um, but we are seeing uh, states across the country turn to those lighter shades of blue and green. So how about in the headlines? 
again, when we look at the headlines, we see that 2.4 million vaccines are actually going into arms each and every day. And again, this is consistent with the Biden administration's aim to have um, 100 million people vaccinated. And uh, again, we, we've seen those efforts to, become, to get the full population vaccinated uh, very evidently. I think we're having a little bit of technical, so hopefully you all can hear me. But 11.5% of the U.S. population has now been fully vaccinated, and we do need that to be over 70% to reach that herd immunity level. So we still have a long way to go. While we're making great strides, we are taking uh, very positive steps. Millions of Americans are still striving to get the COVID-19 vaccines and cannot get them. And one of the key stakeholder groups has been teachers in all 50 states. So we've seen some states move teachers to the forefront and, and to the prioritization of vaccination availability, but that's not consistent across all communities. And so we're continuing to advocate for that at the network. And then again, with the Moderna testing vaccine, uh, we now are seeing it, it include children as young as six months to 11 years old. And of course, we're seeing those children 12 to 17 that uh, are already being tested and vaccinated. Now, again, we did hear from the CDC in the last couple of weeks around updated recommendations for what is acceptable once you are vaccinated. So once vaccinated, you can gather inside with unvaccinated people and you can take off your mask. Uh, if no one is at increased risk of severe illness. Now, if you have high risk members of your family or of your household, it's recommended that you continue to wear your mask and continue to socially distance as much as possible. If you're exposed, you don't need to be tested or quarantined unless you have symptoms. And that is again for those that have been fully vaccinated. Still wear a mask in public and socially distance at all costs. And then a vaccine can take up to two weeks to reach your full effectiveness. So remember, it's not as if you're vaccinated day one, uh, that you have that immunity day one after vaccination. It can take up to two weeks. That's why we continue to reinforce the three W's by the Surgeon General. Wash your hands frequently using soap and water for 20 seconds. Watch your distance, keeping six feet apart and avoiding large crowded areas and wearing a mask to prevent the spread of COVID-19 to protect yourself and others. Now, again, this is that COVID case rate by date, and we like to look at this trend line over the last year because it shows us how we are trending as we uh, have surpassed that one year mark. So here in the week of March 8th and, and into mid-March, we're seeing that consistent decline, uh, now under 50,000 cases, new cases per day. So again, a very positive trend, and, and we're hoping that we can, uh, again, say that the worst of the pandemic is in the rearview mirror for all of us at this point. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Purvi Parikh, and she's going to provide us some vaccine update and issues. Dr. Parikh? Thank you very much. So, you know, this uh, slide we show almost at every of our webinars, it's the coronavirus vaccine tracker. And as you can see, you know, this is a historic time because never before has uh, so many vaccines been in development at the same time for the same reason. So as you can see from phase one uh, through approved, even those that have been abandoned, there's been quite a few. Um, and, you know, to date, uh, you know, I'm happy to say 142 million doses um, have been delivered. Out of those, 110 million approximately have been administered. And luckily, that number keeps rising. And this is important because we're finally seeing a point where the number of people vaccinated has uh, surpassed the amount of confirmed cases of COVID-19. And we want that to continue, that inverse relationship. Um, and as you can see, uh, about 72 million Americans have had uh, at least one dose and uh, close to 39 million have ha are now fully vaccinated, um, which is wonderful. But we can always do more, of course. So, you know, the main concerns is that vaccine hesitancy could actually put a dangerous uh, damper on the country's uh, pandemic response. 
uh, mostly because, you know, right now, even with those great numbers, we're only really at 10% of the country vaccinated. And we, what we really need for that herd immunity and moving back to normal, which we all miss, is closer to 70 to 80%. So we're very far away still. And pockets of some populations most at risk of severe sickness from COVID-19 include those that are most hesitant, ironically. So um, young nurses, Black Americans were still very dubious of the vaccine. And luckily, as Dr. Hooper said, that's also improving. Um, uh, the speed at which it was developed is a big concern amongst many contents and potential side effects. So the concerns and reassurance. Um, the biggest concern that most people have is, you know, they're like, I don't know what's in the vaccine, which I understand. Um, that's a fair concern. Um, the mRNA vaccines in general, um, they're very much like uh, a snapshot, you know. So I like this analogy before that uh, the ex-director of the CDC used that it's, it's like a Snapchat message where it delivers some information, but then the vaccine itself goes away. The thing that stays behind actually is the immunity. So it's not that something is staying in your body forever and ever uh, to cause long-term side effects or damage or uh, do anything to your own um, you know, organs or DNA. Uh, it actually just teaches your body how to fight the virus and then it disintegrates. And quite quickly, actually, within a week, uh, half of it is gone. And then within two weeks, most of it is cleared out of your body. And it's otherwise mostly just made of um, fats, salts, sugars, um, and the actual synthetic uh, messenger RNA. Um, the other concern people have is, uh, you know, the vaccine was developed too fast uh, for us to be sure it's safe. Um, so it was available more quickly than usual, that's true. But the thing is that this vaccine was developed based on like research that we have over the last almost 30 years. Uh, so basically, it's, it's not that we rushed and, you know, crank something out in eight months. It's actually research that's been ongoing since the 1990s. Also, this is the first time where the entire world and all of the, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies, manpower, brain power, are all working towards uh, a common goal. So obviously, it's, things get produced much faster than when um, far less people are working on it. So again, it really wasn't um, safety corners that were cut, but uh, red tape, if that makes sense. Um, the other concerns people have is that the vaccine will give me COVID-19. Uh, so the good news is it's impossible for the vaccine to give you COVID-19 because there's no uh, actual virus in the vaccine at all, whether dead or alive. Um, you can have some symptoms that make you feel like you're sick, but you're actually not sick. It's basically just your immune system um, that's reacting to the vaccine itself. So again, if you do feel those things, uh, just be reassured you're not sick, you're just uh, feeling a normal response. And for most people, it's um, 24 to 48 hours and then they feel back to normal. Uh, the vaccine could alter my DNA. So that's another concern uh, that I hear often. So it definitely cannot interact with your DNA. Um, the mRNA actually doesn't even go near or enter the nucleus of your cells where the DNA lives. So uh, just even from a medical or physiologic standpoint, it's, it's impossible. And as we mentioned before, uh, most of it disintegrates and uh, dissolves within a week or two. So it really doesn't have enough time to do that. Um, the other concern, another concern is the vaccine could give uh, my child autism or a birth defect. Um, and so the simple answer is, you know, vaccines don't cause autism. This has been debunked over and over again. Um, not this one or even other vaccines. Uh, in fact, you know, a, a physician that had made that claim made it based on uh, no evidence or information and has since uh, lost his license because it was so damaging what he had said and, and very untrue. Um, there's also concerns with pregnancy. So, yes, pregnant women should get the vaccine because they're at higher risk of severe COVID illness, um, and it's better for both the mom and baby to get the vaccine. Um, we've had a lot of cases of pregnant women uh, with COVID in the ICU where we were able to save the mom but not the baby or vice versa. So absolutely, it's, uh, you're a more high-risk group when you're pregnant. All right, and uh, with that, I will turn it over for any questions.
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Creek. We love those, you know, sort of myths and myth buster answers. I think that that's so helpful to reducing the concern and the questions around the COVID-19 vaccine. So now we're going to take time for your questions. Again, I'm going to encourage everyone to go to the control panel, enter your questions at this time. We'll get to as many as possible. I also want to remind you that you can download, download your certificate of attendance at this time and that it has been updated to reflect the current date. All right, so the very first question comes from Ms. L, and she says, do you find that Black communities are were just as trusting of Black medical experts as they are with whites? Uh, no, so actually, I think um, Black communities, and that also goes for Native American communities, Indian, Hispanic, they're more trusting of their own uh, type of physician, you know, because I think that there's obviously better cultural competency. Uh, so of course you will feel uh, more comfortable with somebody who understands, um, that understands you, who may look like you, who may have the same traditions at home as you. So definitely we do see a difference. And, and that's why, you know, even with a lot of the vaccine outreach, uh, we do work with the physicians, religious leaders, healthcare workers in the communities, uh, the trusted individuals that uh, people go to for questions and guidance. Absolutely. And one of the reasons why we think that and we have been advocating for there to be more uh, intentional efforts around in including people of color in the medical profession and, and especially as physicians of training and having more, um, you know, concerted efforts towards that. Um, I, the next comment comes from Marsha, who says, great presentation, but did I miss any admission to the fact that there really is good basis or good reason for Black folks' mistrust of the healthcare community? Community. And absolutely, Marsha, I'll comment to this first. I mean, we at the network absolutely agree and recognize that there has been legitimate reasons for this level of mistrust. There are, are proven incidents like Tuskegee um, that unfortunately have really filled, ha, have filtered and, and fueled that mistrust over decades. And so it's necessary that we continue to admit that and recognize the sins of the past so that we can move forward in a more productive way. Dr. Creek, anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, I mean, you said it perfectly. I think it's the, the past incidences that uh, have created the mistrust, you know, because Black communities were betrayed. So it's absolutely warranted, but it's very important that you know, that mistrust is broken down since, as Dr. Hooper said, um, you know, the rates of COVID are much higher uh, by three times and complications much higher. So it's just unfortunately uh, widening, widening those health disparities that already exist. <laughs> Exactly. And even though that trust may be rooted and grounded in, in unfortunate incidents of the past, we have to acknowledge those and begin to move forward in a more productive way. Um, so this next question is around herd immunity. And, you know, certainly we're striving towards herd immunity in the summer of 2021 or fall of 2021. But is this even possible given that children likely won't be widely vaccinated until 2022? Uh, no, that's a very good question. So, you know, uh, children are very much uh, involved in the whole herd immunity um, equation, but the good news is actually we're planning on uh, starting some vaccinations for children this summer. And I don't know if uh, you all had heard, but Alaska already started vaccinating from age 16 and up. So they're pretty far ahead of the other states. So they started, I think, last week already with 16 and up. So I believe this summer we'll be able to do teenagers, adolescents, Yesterday, Moderna actually started their trial with uh, down to age six months, uh, like infants. So I think actually we may be hopefully able to get children vaccinated sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, that's certainly what we are, again, advocating for, that once we know that it is safe and efficacious, even in those younger populations, that we move forward very rapidly and that manufacturing um, demands, you know, keep up with that uh, needed supply to get children fully vaccinated, reach herd immunity, and, and again, whatever that next normal may be. I'm not sure we'll ever return to a pre-pandemic uh, state, but certainly whatever that next normal holds. Now, the next question comes from Charles and he says, how do you answer people that are convinced by anti-vax quote unquote physicians or religious channels or, or individuals saying that this is quote a shot in the dark? 
So those anti-vaxxers, how do you address that concern in your own practice, Dr. Parikh? Right, it is difficult. Luckily, like majority of the people who have concerns aren't truly uh, anti-vaxxers. They have specific concerns. And I think just taking the time to listen to what they are, then it's very easy to kind of um, address them. And then most people actually feel much better and feel comfortable going forward with it. You know, um, there are a few, however, that are like very adamantly against vaccines and are anti-vaxxers. But again, you know, you try your best to kind of show the information and refute it, but um, it really depends on the individual. Some people are very difficult uh, to convince and some it's difficult to combat, but the good news is majority of people I've found with one-on-one -on -one conversations are actually very easily convinced. And, and I think those one-on-one -on -one conversations are actually more important than any of these talks or anything that's you know said in the media or social media, because then you really have a chance to, I think people just wanna be heard. And if you can hear their concerns and address them, uh, actually goes a very long way. Well, and to your point, it is about creating that trusting environment where you, someone even feels comfortable bringing that forward. I think that's half the battle right. is getting them to voice that concern and then have you know a, a conversation about it. So kudos to you in that regard. Now, Sharon asked if you could talk about the fact that you know it, it seems that people ha oftentimes are having worse side effects to their second dose of the two dose vaccines. Um, is that what you've seen in, in your own practice? Yes, actually it's um, very common and expected because the second dose kind of acts as a booster dose. So the first dose is uh, the first time, you know, your immune system is like meeting uh, the COVID-19 protein or getting introduced to it. So it won't react as strongly, but then the second time, it's actually expected for your immune system to have a stronger uh, response and stronger side effects because now um, three or four weeks have passed, you have some immunity, so your immune system should remember it and recognize it and uh, respond more strongly. So this is also why people who've had COVID-19 and recovered uh, sometimes will get that booster effect or that uh, reintroduction effect with the first dose. Um, they'll have the strong symptoms then. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I think that that that's one of the things that you, we can share with people is that it, it could actually be a positive sign. It's not necessary that you have those side effects, but if you do have them, um, it could be a positive sign that your body is receiving the vaccine and responding accordingly. Um, but in the absence of it, doesn't mean it's not working either. So that can be a little bit confusing. Um, so the next question comes from Maria, and she says, is research continuing on the effectiveness of the vaccine? Do you think we'll need a booster each year? Uh, so that we'll find out. Uh, you know, all of these trials are ongoing. Uh, and they'll continue to run, uh, you know, for the next few years. So we'll find out exactly how long immunity lasts, if boosters are needed. Uh, so the main thing is kind of to stay tuned, you know, it hasn't even been a full year since the trials began, but we are uh, estimating at least one year, the immunity should last and we're hoping longer, but all of the companies are studying that as well as booster doses to see uh, if that is needed, especially with the new variants. Really great question coming from Jackie here. She says, could you share with us if it's possible for fully vaccinated individuals to carry or transport the virus and cause infection in unvaccinated individuals? Uh, so that's actually a very good question. And that's why we've still been having people be careful and continuing to mask and social distance um, because we don't know exactly the full transmission picture. You know, we think we have some reports that transmission, asymptomatic, especially transmission decreases um, with the vaccine, but we don't have it confirmed yet. And remember, a vaccine is not a cure. It's just meant to essentially save your life or keep you out of the hospital. So you will still, it still you can get COVID-19. The whole point is that it's more like a minor cold rather than a life-threatening illness. Um, so if you do get sick with COVID, even if it's milder, you absolutely can infect other people, especially if you have symptoms. Uh, now, the part that we don't know for sure is if you don't have symptoms, if you can spread it or not, even after you have the vaccine. So that's why uh, we're still telling people to be ca cautious because, you know, in this pandemic, 40% of the cases were spread by people not even realizing it, you know, the asymptomatic spread.
Yes, absolutely. Very good point. And, and again, there are still a, many unanswered questions that we need to continue to collect data and better understand. Now, um, our next question is around vaccines. And we've heard in the news that the Moderna and Pfizer two-dose vaccines that are greater than 90% efficacious and, and certainly effective in preventing individuals as well uh, from getting COVID-19, but also um, preventing mm -hmm. complication uh, and death and hospitalization. Now the J&J, &J, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there's been a lot in the media about it being less efficacious, less than set, or around 70%. Um, and, and especially in communities of color, we've heard this mistrust of like, should I take this less efficacious J&J &J vaccine? So, oops. Can you share what your thoughts are about that? Because I know we've had some conversations about really the bottom line is hospitalization and death and, and what your belief is around all of the vaccines, including the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, right. So, you know, I, you can't really say that it's uh, less efficacious uh, unless all of the vaccines are studied in the um, same trial at the exact same time you know, in all of the same locations, because um, Moderna and Pfizer, actually the trials ended before a lot of these variants were even circulating. So um, you can't really compare it to Johnson & Johnson because if they were all done at the same time, the efficacy may actually all be very similar. The more important thing to look at is that um, Johnson & Johnson actually prevents death 100%. It also prevents hospitalizations 100% in its trials and even severe COVID, uh, it was over 85%. And this is even in areas of the world like South Africa where that variant was very rampant. So I actually think it's an excellent vaccine. Um, the nice thing is it's only one dose, so you get immunized much faster. Normally it takes six weeks because you have to get both doses and then wait two weeks afterwards. So um, so there's a lot of benefit to it. So I would still take it. I, you know, I, I tell everyone, take whatever shot that you can get first, you know, so uh, because they all will save your life. They will all keep you out of the hospital. Great. And so thinking about side effects from vaccines, a follow up question came in. If those side effects from the vaccine last more than three or four days, what would you advise, especially an elderly patient to do? Uh, then you should, you know, definitely uh, speak to your physician and, you know, call your doctor because if it is lasting that long, um, there might be a chance that it's, it's more than just the side effects from the vaccine, uh, especially if it's between the first and second dose, you won't be fully immunized yet. So there's still a chance you can get uh, an actual infection in between, even if it's not COVID. So yeah, if it is lasting three or four days, it's a good idea to consult your physician. Okay. Now, this is the question that we've heard, and, and we talked about the pregnancy concerns, but this has been uh, ill-reported in the media around potential spontaneous abortions due to COVID vaccines. Is this just a myth? Uh, is there any data to support this concern around infertility or spontaneous abortions? Right. So, yeah, this is a myth. We actually now have data. We didn't have it before. We have data from the first three months of vaccination in the V-safe um, pregnancy registry. And actually there was no increased cases of you know, preterm uh, abortion, miscarriage, or other complications in diabetes, uh, in pregnancy like gestational diabetes or whatnot compared to someone who didn't take the vaccine. In fact, in some cases, um, we found that the incidence was even a little bit lower in the vaccinated group. Uh, so that's all very reassuring. Um, and then also I know one of the myths that I've heard is that the vaccine could cause infertility, uh, but that's also not true because many of the participants who are in the Moderna and Pfizer trial um, are now pregnant um, and then and many who've taken the vaccine and weren't pregnant are now pregnant. So uh, both of those are unfounded concerns. Okay. Yeah, and, and I do see one or two comments about um, my comment earlier about Tuskegee. I don't mean that that's the only um, instance of mistrust or misuse. We, we've heard thousands, unfortunately, over the years of advocating on behalf of the allergy and asthma community. So certainly that's the, one of the more prominent, um, but there are, are many different instances for sure. Um, let's see. So our next question, how long does immunity last once you receive the vaccine? Um, right. So again, you know, we don't know for sure because it's still been less than a year uh, since we started the trials, but at least one year we're projecting and hopefully longer. But again, that, that part of the story 
uh, only time will tell, but it's being followed very closely by all the vaccine companies. So I see that there are a couple of questions for Dr. Hooper. Unfortunately, she had to go for another commitment. And so we will pass those along. But the uh, NIH SEAL program, Community Engagement, Leadership, uh, uh, Action and Leadership. And so if you just Google NIH SEAL, uh, C-E-A-L, you'll come up with all of the, the links and the resources that she spoke about. All right, I think that we have one final question and it, it's an interesting one as well. Um, so it says, um, it, it's in regard to herd immunity and we've heard a lot about herd immunity when it comes to COVID-19, but do we actually even get herd immunity on something like the flu and what's the difference? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So actually, yes, we do. So that's the reason we normally, you know, don't have to mask or stay in our homes with every flu season, uh, because over many, many years of having the flu vaccine, herd immunity has been established. So even though the, the flu can change year to year, right, overall, our immune system still remember some version of the flu and is still able to fight it. So yes, you absolutely should get your flu shot every year to update your immunity and uh, to prevent death hospitalizations, but um, because of herd immunity, you know, the, every time there's flu season, we don't have a pandemic that shuts down the whole world. Um, and the same goes for measles and, and many other infectious diseases. It's it's largely because of vaccinations that these um, illnesses are have been around without taking out most of the population. So eventually, we will get there with COVID nineteen because it's not going to go away, you know. But uh, you know, we'll have to adapt. And that way, that's other reason to get vaccinated because as we hear about these new variants, uh, the vaccine will still protect you because the immune system is very smart. It can retain old information and you'll still be less sick than if you had had no vaccine at all. Absolutely. And I said that was the last one, but I saw one that I just can't uh, move away from. And it's a final question from Alina. If someone had COVID-19, they now have the antibodies, is it still recommended that they receive the vaccine? Uh, yes, uh, and I'm glad that this question was brought up uh, because the natural immunity uh, from COVID is very variable, you know, and we found that the vaccine actually produces um, a stronger va uh, immune response, not just for antibodies, but everyone needs to remember that T cells are also very important in fighting off COVID. So it gives good immunity on both ends of that, uh, more so than a natural infection. And we also know that um, with natural infection, the immunity does fade. I, I myself have patients who had antibodies in June that no longer have them. So um, you can get reinfected and you can get sick again. So that's a reason that you should still get it. Absolutely. Well, again, I can't say thank you enough to Dr. Parikh, to Dr. Webb Hooper, for each of you today for listening as we looked at the need for health equity in high risk communities of color. Thank you all for joining us today. Again, please be sure to join us for our next webinars. We have several upcoming. But the very next one is on March 25th at 4 p.m. with Dr. Todd Marr on Breathe Easier, Smoking Facts and Cessation Tips. Again, I, I cannot say enough to the team at Allergy and Asthma Network, all the support that they've given over the last year as we've continued to respond to your community requests and needs around COVID-19. On behalf of the network, we want to thank you for trusting us, for joining us in this journey over the last year. And we certainly want to encourage you to visit allergyandasthmanetwork.org for more information for our COVID-19 Resource Center. And again, on behalf of the staff, I just want to say thank you for your time and for, for your participation. We'll continue to work each day to help every single one of you breathe better together. Thank you and have a wonderful day.